stand and sing together. Genesis this morning, Genesis 35, <clears throat> if you want to turn over there, but um, in Genesis 35, it's the end of, uh, well, uh, kind of marks a, uh, a marking point for the story of Jacob, um, and in 35 there, he had uh, went through some things leading up to that chapter. Um, when we look at the story of uh, Jacob and his brother, you see how Jacob was a, uh, a youngster. I mean, he was the younger one, and, uh, but he had been told before they was born that he was going to rule over his brother. And um, we see how that happened. Esau despised his birthright, and Jacob was, uh, then went in and took the blessing. And then you see how Jacob was sent away, and he went to his uh, uncle's house, and he... Uh, Stayed there for a while and worked for Laban and all the things that went on there. But before he went to see Laban, God had appeared to him at Bethel and told him that he'd be with him and uh, told him that he would inherit the, uh, the promises and the covenant of Abraham. And Jacob had made a promise there that he, uh, had he decided to, um, had God took care of him, what I mean, if God had took care of him there then fed him and clothed him and sheltered him, that when he came back to his father's house, he would be... Uh, uh, God would be Jacob's God. But so as we see here, as now we're at a place where Jacob was coming back home. And so after all this, God had been faithful. God had brought Jacob back. And we see in uh, Genesis 32, 9, where uh, Jacob was talking to uh, God, and he was about to face his brother Esau after a long time, and knowing Esau had hated him. But it said, Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred. I will uh, deal with thee, or well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For, uh, my sta for with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. But in all this trouble here, Jacob, I love this, how he was coming back, and he's going to face Esau, and he's afraid. And what he had done is um, uh, he called out to God. He called out and reminded God of the promises that were made. But I love how in this chapter in 32 that God reminds Jacob of a promise that he made. He promised that if God brought him back that God would be his God. 
And so Jacob, we see at the end of this chapter how he wrestles with God and he breaks his hip and God changes his name and he uh, calls it, uh, he calls him his God. At the end of chapter 33, you know, when he deliver, brings him in to meet his brother, he calls him El Elohi Israel. But he called him the God of Israel. But what I want to talk about was that brings us to 35. So all this trouble and all this stuff that's been going on and he's, you know, all that we talked about here, we get to chapter 35. And Jacob finds more hardship. God tells him here after the situation with Hammer and Dinah and, and, and the sons killing the, the men and Jacob's afraid that the people of the land are going to rise against him in chapter 34. In 35, God comes to him again. He says, go up to Bethel. He tells him to go back to the place where God first appeared to him. And when he goes up to this place, more, uh, more trouble falls because now um, uh, Rachel, I mean, uh, his mama's, uh, nurse there, Deborah, dies. So now he's got dealing with death on the way to Bethel. Then when he gets there, God appears to him, and God reminds him, reassures him, that he's going to inherit the covenant. And he was with him in all this, in all this trial and all this stuff going on, all this death and, and, and hardship. God was still with him. And then after that, after God appeared to him and spoke to him, we get to the verses here, uh, verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, before she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried there in the way uh, to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And the thought I had today was these two names right here, Benoni and Benjamin. And with all this trouble and all this uh, that Jacob had gone through, God was with him. And the name Benoni, I've come to find out, is son of my sorrows. And with her dying breath here, Rachel names him son of my sorrows. And Jacob here, I, I imagine he's, he's hurt and, and, and dealing, because Rachel was his beloved wife. But son of my sorrows brought my mind back to this time of year. And I thought about it. it was, I don't think it's a coincidence that this was on the way to Bethlehem. And I thought about how in Isaiah 53, verse 3, we hear about the man of sorrows. And I thought about how he was born to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And why was he born for that? He was born so he could bear my griefs and carry my sorrows. But I love how the story don't end here. Because there's the next little verse, the next little part of that in verse 18 said, but his father called him Benjamin. And I love how he was not going to be remembered as the son of my sorrows. And how when we look at the cross and we look at the sufferings of Christ, there's a lot from this side and from the flesh side we can look at and say there's a lot of cause for defeat or sorrow. You know, it was even prophesied that Mary would have her sword pierced through her own soul when, when he died. And from the, that side we can see the son of my sorrows. But I love how when he's looking at it from his father's perspective, he was going to call him Benjamin, the son of the right hand. And I love how, you know, the son of my sorrows, it just painted a picture for me on the way to Bethlehem, the son of my sorrows becomes named the son of the right hand. For nowadays he is the, you know, that's where Jesus is now. After he died and he carried our burdens and our sorrows and he's, he's ascended to be on high at the right hand of the father. But I love how we read over in Hebrews 2 and we read in, Philippians uh, uh, chapter 2. And in those places we see how it was necessary that he came and he lived and he was humbled and he, he lived as a suffering servant. And because he did so and because he humbled himself, God highly exalted him and put him at the right hand of the Father and he did so for us that he might be made perfect through suffering, that he can be our great high priest who can be touched with our feelings and our infirmities and, our, and, and he made atonement for our iniquities. And I was thinking about, as you look at the story of Jacob here, how everything leading up to this, how God was with him, and even though he wasn't perfect, and he was named a deceiver, God changed his name to Israel later on when God redeemed him, and God took him as his own and stayed with him in all his troubles and his trials. And I believe we see here a picture, and it comes to completion here in Genesis 35 with a picture of Christ and, and what, he would, what he would do when he come to bear our sins, to bear our troubles, and how... Even today, he's at the right hand of the Father. And we can still call on him. We can still get a hold of him. And he's still with us in our troubles. But we have that advocate with the Father. 
But uh, as we think about this season, you know, that's a, a comfort to my heart, and that's kind of my thought I got to present today is just remembering that how our the son of our sorrows, is, he's, he's still with us. He's still the, the one who will bear our burdens with us, and we can always call on him. And uh, that's all I've got today. But uh, anybody's got a prayer request uh, to mention? Well, good morning to everyone. I tell you, it's starting to look like Christmas around here, isn't it? But uh, who's ready for some sunshine? <laughs> well, I tell you, I'm, I've, I've had enough of clouds lately, so I'm ready to see some sun, that's for sure. Time for a lesson, security in place of fear. But before we get started, anybody have prayer requests they'd like to make known in the class? Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> it said security in place of fear. You know, I remember <clears throat> when I was uh, growing up, when my parents or my grandparents would hold me in their arms. Just how secure I felt when they did that. You know, nothing, nothing was going to be able to harm me. You know, and that was a good feeling. But when you grow up, get out on your own, the feeling of insecurity, it can happen sometimes. You know, when I began working at the EMS, I was insecure. Working with the doctors and the nurses and having to tell them what I found wrong with the patient. You know, they were educated. They knew a lot more than, than I did about medical care. But then, you know, I went to school. I went to school for another couple of years, and I began, I became a little more educated. But yet, I still felt that insecurity when it came to doing my job. But then I started noticing something. The pedestal that I put the doctors and nurses up on I learned that they were human, just like I was. You know, I was up in the ICU unit to take a patient to Baptist. It was an emergency. The patient, they were in bad shape. They didn't have no blood pressure. I noticed the doctor. He was there, and he was given the wrong medication. They had worked on this patient for while I was there for 10, 15 minutes, who knows how long before that, well, I told my partner that was, was with me, I said, if we don't get this patient out of here, they're going to kill him. But as a paramedic, you know, I couldn't tell a doctor what to do. So what I did, I just said to everyone around me, I said, you know what would help this patient? I bet this patient could use a dopamine drip. That would help, I bet. Well, the doctor, he didn't respond immediately. But then after about a minute later, he goes, let's start a dopamine drip. Patient's BP improved, and we took them to Baptist. So what I'm saying here is that people, they can intimidate you and make you feel insecure when you're around them. But they're human. And they also, they make mistakes. There is no one that is any better than any of you when it comes to the most important thing. God loves you. And he's going to take care of you. And nothing can take that away. Now, now some people... They may have an insecurity when, with their relationship with God. You know, they may have, they may have sin in their life, and, and the devil, no, the devil, he will put doubts in their mind that they have no security when it comes to God, which that includes Christians too. You know, Satan will do, he'll do all kinds of things to try to make us have any doubts. And, and, and make us insecure. But salvation is only through the, our faith in Jesus Christ. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our salvation 
It's secured. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can take that away. There is no reason for us to have any fear because we are secure in Christ. You know, Paul here in this lesson is writing to the Roman church and he assures them that salvation was absolutely secure. In verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To, to them who are, in, who are called according to his purpose. Okay, we know all things work t- together for good. You know, some people have a misunderstanding of what this verse here is actually saying. You know, they may think that God is promising that whatever they face in life, it will be, to their be- for their best interest which is true, but it's not meaning that their life will not be without pain and heartache. Those that think that way, they're being self-centered. It's all about them. Now, God, he does. He wants what's best for us. So the question is, what is best for us? It's not for us having plenty of money and having all the good things that this world has to offer. What is best for us is for us to grow and to be more Christ-like. We may have to face some hard times. You know, things can happen in our lives that we may not understand and may not ever understand until we get to heaven. God is in control, and we can be sure that all things work together for good in His will. And that, and that good for those, who, uh, uh, for those who love God. So thing is, the question is, so why do we love God? Because He first loved us. And he also, he gave us an undeserved gift of salvation by his grace. To them who are called according to his purpose. You know, when we were saved, we were called by the Holy Spirit to accept his gift by faith. And this fulfills his good purpose. In verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Those who accept Jesus Christ, God calls them who believe to himself. Nothing surprises God on someone's actions. It says, for whom he did foreknow. God's knowledge has no limits. Now, this can be difficult for us, for me, to understand sometimes. But Paul says he also did did predestinate. Now, some think this means that God has foreknowledge on who will accept him is their Lord and Savior, and who will not? This may be true. You know, I don't know. But others believe that it's when God, when God created the world, He already knew that sin would enter in, and man would be a sinful person. So God knew that we needed His grace. So He sent His Son, to be, a, to be a sacrificial lamb for our sins so that we could be saved from our sins. And then when we're saved, then we'll be, we are to conform to the image of his son. We're to reflect. We're to reflect uh, the moral likeness of Jesus to the world. This is God's will for us. Then the last part of this verse, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, Jesus was the firstborn of everything. He existed before everything. He created the heavens and the, and the earth and everything that's in it. Jesus was. He was the firstborn from the dead. He was the first to raise from the grave and to never die again. As a believer, we will also share his resurrection and his glory. In verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. In whom he called, them he also justified. In whom he justified, them he also glorified. You know, all that were called by the Holy Spirit and accepts God's grace and his free gift of salvation, God calls them justified. We're righteous. We're righteous in Christ. And it doesn't have anything to do with our works. It's a free gift. It's a free gift of God's grace. And when we're, when we're, and we're free, free from the penalty of sin, we're born again. We're a child of God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, next Paul says that those who are justified, they will be glorified. Glorification is the final step. We'll be resurrected and, and be changed to Christ likeness and then live with him forever in heaven. This is where in verse 28 it's true. All things work good. All things do work together for the good of his redeemed people. This is the reason. A safe person, we should never have any fears. God, he is going to take care of us. Which leads us to our next verse. Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be forced, who can be against us? God be forced, who can be against us? Well, the world is going to be against us. People, some people is going to hate us. And Satan will do anything to try to separate us from God. But no one or nothing can touch our soul. We're adopted. We're adopted in God's family. We're a child of God. We're coheres co co with Christ. You know, our prayers, our prayers are lifted by the Spirit and taken directly to God. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. We're justified. And one day we're going to be glorified. No one or nothing can, can do a thing to take that away from us. We're secured in Christ. In verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all these things? So how much does God love us? He spared, he spared not his own son so that he could deliver us up, to, all of us up to him. No one should never question how much God loves them. The proof of his love to mankind, it was made on the cross. The greatest love that could ever be shown. Jesus, he made the ultimate payment for our sins. So if God would give up his precious son for us, then we can be sure God's going to provide. He's going to provide for his children. He's going to provide for his children's security both now and forever. We have nothing to fear because we're protected by Jesus' sacrifice. 
verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. You know, over the past 2,000 years or so, Christians, they have been accused of all kinds of things just because they're a Christian. And we're seeing that now even in America. Government officials making comments saying, Christians, they're the problem and they're evil. You know, many people in the world has been jailed and killed because of their faith. It's just a matter of time that we're going to see this in America. I really believe that. I mean, this is the reason why a lot of our youth, they're being taught in schools to hate America. And don't think they're not being taught that Christians are bad. Don't think they're not being taught that. You know, I was at the director of admissions meeting this week concerning our needs and, and what we need to look for for our new director. And the state has done a study in each county here in North Carolina just exactly where we stand. Now, remember, we're in the Bible Belt in, in America right here. More Christians is in the South and Southeast than anywhere in America. This is the study in Wilkes County. In our county, only 25% profess to be a Christian and go to church. Our churches have some work to do. And our, and our association needs to help our churches. You know, they said also in the Northeast, only 2% are Christians. And, people, and these people, though, they're moving down here, which is affecting our neighborhoods. Fewer and fewer people are going to church and putting their faith in God. It's affecting our society. So we can see why Christians are being attacked more and more in our country. But the good news is that God has justified us. Not that we earned it or not that we deserved it, but through God's grace and his saving faith. For it says in Ephesians, everybody knows this verse, for by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No matter what happens, no one can take that away from us. In verse 34, who is he that condemneth if it is if it is if it is Christ that died, ye rather that is risen again? who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercessions for us. Paul here confirms that our salvation, it's sure in Christ. He says, who is he that condemneth? Well, the answer is no one. No one can condemn us. He points out that Jesus is risen. He's alive. He defeated sin. He's defeated death. But also he is sitting at the right hand of God. But also very important for us, Jesus is making intercessions for us along with the Holy Spirit. Don't think for a moment that Satan is accusing us of all kinds of things. But Jesus is saying, no, he's mine. She's mine. My blood, my blood has covered his sins. He is righteous and he is justified. No one can condemn us before God. Is the title of, the, the title of our lesson says, we are secured in Christ. Verse 35 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So Paul asked the question, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Well, the answer again is no one. Then he lists some bad situations in the world the world might think might separate us from God's love. Tribulation, or we can say trouble. Distress, or we can say hardships. Persecution, which the persecution was a, had a lot going on when Paul wrote this letter. Famine, meaning the lack of food and lack of water. Nakedness refers to the lack of clothing and, and shelter. Pearl which is the threat of bodily harm. The sword, which is the weapon of war or execution. None of these things, none of these, these things can, can separate us from God's care. Paul, Paul was wanting to encourage us. He was wanting to encourage believers not to give in to our fears, but instead, instead look to God to be the rescue. In verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the, sh for the slaughter. Paul here is quoting Psalms 44 and verse 22. The psalmist was reminding God that, that the people in Israel, they were being faithful to him, but yet they were still facing death from their enemies. They felt, they felt like sheep headed to the butcher shop. What Paul was doing, he was just pointing out here that God's children, we're still going to face people that's going to oppose us. Satan will do anything, again, to try to separate us from God. In verse 27, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through, through him that love us. You know, Paul says that, that we're, a part, we're a part of God's family. So being a part of God's family, we're not the victims. We're not a victim. We're guaranteed victory over our enemies. It's a guarantee. Now, we may have to suffer some. We may have some hardships. But God, he has the last word. It says through him that, that love us, that, it, that is how, that's how we're going to overcome. We don't have to surrender when things get tough. God, he is always present. And he's going to help us endure adversity and also conquer it. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So here Paul goes just a little bit deeper, saying nothing can separate us from God's love. Death or life cannot separate us. Supernatural forces, things present, things to come, cannot separate us. Then he reinforces it here in verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's love has no limits. Zero. There is no measure. There is no way to measure. Or there is no measure that can measure God's love. Paul, what he's doing, he's just assuring us that we're safe. We're safe in the love of Christ. Yes, we're going to face some suffering hardships. You know, many people, many people in the world, they really face some hard times just because they profess Jesus as their Savior. But we should never, ever forget Nothing, absolutely nothing, can never separate us from God's love. Always remember that, no matter what we're facing. 
Anyway, that's all I have this morning. Uh, anybody have anything they'd like to add? And 143, let's stand together and sing. <clears throat> This morning, certainly good to see you. It's good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? And uh, appreciate uh, each one here this morning. Looking forward to the service, a very special day. And looking forward to preacher more and the sermon this morning and what the Lord has for us, our children's church. And already a good opening, good Sunday school. We just had a good day, and we praise the Lord for it. I wonder maybe there's a prayer request, something to mention for prayer this morning. 33 our Sunday school and then uh, have a couple of uh, some announcements to make. Uh, number one this Wednesday Lord willing in our Wednesday night service be having conference meeting so I'll mention that and then uh, Petey put that up our Christmas program next uh, Sunday night uh, 6 o'clock and uh, said if you want to volunteer could still use some help see Brother Gary or Michaela uh, today so uh, and then next Sunday and then after the program I will have refreshments as we normally do so you'll be planning on that next Sunday 6 p.m. be praying about that and looking forward to that it's just good to be in the Lord's house isn't it and it's been such a special Sunday already uh, our opening our Sunday school so Brian come for children's church How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Have us a Kool-Aid jammer. We're good to go, ain't we? Ready to go. This morning, uh, my thought I, this week, of course, uh, is, you know, been about Christmas. We're getting closer about Christmas, and you start thinking about Christmas. And the title this morning is Peace in the Valley. And Peace in the valleys is kind of uh, odd in some ways. We sing about lots of times when we're on a mountaintop and how things are good on a mountaintop, but we don't think about the valley being 
the peace and the good things sometimes in the valley. And, and even David said, you know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because God's with you. But this morning, I was heard a story of a rich man. And I know everybody's thinking, you know, we're talking about Chris Taylor or John Merle this morning, but it's not those guys this morning. It's another rich man. And he had, he had put out, he wanted uh, to the artist, you know, he'd, he'd spend a small fortune to that artist that could come up with the perfect presence of peace in a picture he'd painted. And, of course, people got interested in that because there's money to be made. And artists got busy and they started making paintings. And they'd send them, you know, set them up and let him look at them. And they painted sunsets. Now, I want you to use your imagination to help me, everybody. Use your imagination this morning. Okay, get, get, get a picture. But, you know, he did point, or paint of sunsets and of sunrises and uh, uh, beautiful lakes and meadows and, you know, all these things which are peaceful. But as he looked through these things, there wasn't a one. And the day came that there were two set before him that as he looked at them. He had the first one that was, it was a beautiful lake. And, and the water was like glass and, and, and it was just calm. And, and the sky was just dark blue with little clouds wisping through. I mean, a beautiful painting. And then the one beside it was a painting of a lake also. But that lake was whipped by the wind because there were you know, mountains around it too. And the sky was dark. And, and the clouds you know, looked like they were ready just to bust into a storm. And the wind, you know, the waves on the lake. And everybody stood and looked. And I mean, which one would you think would be peace? The first one? Does that sound right? Be the first one maybe? But he looked at them and he said, I want the second painting. And everybody was like, well, what in the world? He said, if you'll look, something you've not seen, I want you to look at the mountain on the background of this picture. And I want you to see that waterfall that's on that mountain. And if you look just to the left of that waterfall that's on that mountain, you'll see a little crag, a little place in the rock. And in that rock, you're going to see a little bird. And that little bird's just sitting on a nest on her little blue eggs. She's sheltered from the storm in the safety of that mountain. The perfect presentation of peace. This morning, we're sheltered in the very arms of God this morning. Though the storms might rage around us, we're safe. In his arms this morning. And the story, the Christmas, uh, right quick, the Christmas story. I want you, uh, Petey, put up Luke 1, 29, 30. Mary had just been visited by Gabriel. So she's heading into a storm whether she knows or not in her life. She's an unwed, unmarried, teenage Jewish girl, never known a man. She's not a lot older than some of you guys. And she's being told and seeing an angel in front of her. I imagine her world turned around. But this morning, what did Gabriel say to her? She was troubled situation. Verse 30, Petey. An angel said to her, fear not. Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. But you know, Mary, we think about Mary and Joseph and the baby, right? We, we, we seem to forget about Joseph. Joseph, over in the book of Matthew then, he was heading into this little storm here too. I mean, this is his woman he was a spouse to. This is his woman he wants to marry. This is the woman he's going to have, uh, have a life with. And all of a sudden, she's be found with a baby. But he said, while well, he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary. Thy wife, or, thou, or that which is conceived in her, is of the Holy Ghost. So Joseph and Mary are facing storms here, right? Well, there's some other fellows that's getting ready to get their life uprooted a little bit. 
And there are the shepherds sitting out there minding their sheep. And the angels appeared unto them, of course. And he had glad tidings to bring to them, to all men. But the angels said what to them? Fear not. Fear not. Do y'all know in the book of John 14 and 27, Jesus himself says, peace, I leave with you. He said, my peace, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a comfort to me today. The feet. We're all going to face storms in our life. Every single one of us. You guys, maybe you've not been through one yet, but you're heading towards one. This world seeks peace. We talk about Christmas all the time, don't we? Peace on earth. We want peace. We want peace. But this world can't give peace. Peace can only found, be found through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Him alone. For that peace in the valley. Jesus Himself, as He was born. The, the, John 14. The cross is coming. He's talking to His disciples. I think about what he faced. The man of sorrow, as he's called. With full knowledge of what was getting ready to take place, he still cared about me. With the beating, Gary, that was coming. Separation from his father coming. The pain, the anguish that he was going to suffer in his life. Even his very people rejected him. But he still spoke peace to me. Over 500 times the word fear is mentioned in the King James Bible. 71 times fear not's mentioned. 32 times be not afraid. 103 times. But I'd say this morning he only had to say it one time. Fear not. But he cared and he loved us and loves us enough that he continued to tell us today, don't be afraid. There's peace in Jesus Christ today. I love Christmas, don't you? And I love Jesus. And I want to thank you for salvation. Liam, you way over there? You got any prayer requests? Bible school? Okay, good. We got anything down here? Bible school. Church. Children church? Yeah. Bible school? Let's remember Preacher Lloyd today as he brings a message a day too. And um, let's pray for peace that comes through Jesus. And maybe we celebrate Christmas this year in a way that will be pleasing to him and honor him. Y'all ready to pray? Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you for this day. I thank you for your love, mercy, and grace, God, Lord. Lord, that you've just so richly bestowed upon us, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in church, this opportunity, Lord, to worship you once again. And God, I thank you for this opportunity in children's church, Lord, to once again proclaim Jesus Christ. And God, I ask you, Father, to be with these young people, God, as they grow and uh, knowing, Father, that these storms of life, they're going to come. But, Father, the peace that's found in you, I praise you for that, Lord. I pray, Lord, today for the salvation, God, of those that don't know you as a personal Savior. I pray, Lord, today that uh, they might, Lord, the Christian, Lord, out there somewhere might be able to reach, Lord, reach, Lord, that, that with your word, your message, God, that they might be saved. I pray, God, as we're going to Christmas, God, I thank you for your coming. I thank you for your birth, your death, and your resurrection, God, and I thank you for your salvation, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'll move. Brother Lord, help him preach the word of God. Be with us as the church. Bless us, encourage us. Lord, help us to be that you'd have us to be. We're going to thank you in the name of Jesus. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, Lord, this morning. And amen.
sing together hymn number 137. 137. see you again in the Lord's house and we're so blessed and privileged to be here this morning and uh, we appreciate uh, Preacher Moore, he was uh, he and Janet have been living between two houses and now they've moved here, uh, their permanent residence here to be on the mountain and I'll just say a word that uh, our church Bethany is certainly blessed to have Preacher Moore and to have Janet here, she's been here all along and they're just such a, just such a good team. And uh, I was thinking, uh, we're blessed to have a good seasoned preacher here. And I'm looking forward to the message, what God's going to speak to us, to our hearts through preacher uh, more this morning. And I'll ask him to come and uh, just preach to us, just as the Lord leads him, touches him, and it'd be such a blessing to us. It's good to see you this morning. I invite your attention to. Luke chapter 2. You know, the socially accepted level of charity is usually raised a little bit at Christmas time. We don't, maybe I should speak for myself, I don't give to many people I see begging on the street, certainly not in the job market we have today. Where I've lived for the last 30, 40 years, and it's been two or three different places, every street corner has somebody sitting on a bucket or something holding out their hand. At Christmas time, we, we raise the level of our thoughts about those people maybe a little bit. We hear, you know, to be nice, or we want to be nice. Or get the Christmas spirit, you know. We share gifts. Sometimes, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but sometimes we give gifts to people we don't really want to give a gift to. Uh, it could be a member of your family, but it could be somebody else. But we do that. And we give a little extra to missions, maybe. Put a dollar in the Salvation Army bucket. Or if we really feel ashamed, we might put two. But most people's attitude is, just don't mess up my Christmas. Don't do anything to mess me up. One thing is clear from the stories of Christ's birth in the New Testament, and that is that God consistently and intentionally broke with what was popular to call, bless, and exalt the overlooked. Take, for instance, Mary and Joseph. They're an obscure couple, probably 
not many people knew them where they had gone to register for the taxation. They were an obscure couple, and they were uh, about 70 miles from their home. They had to go to Bethlehem to be registered for the taxation that Caesar Augustus had demanded. You had to go back to your hometown. And so uh, we see them, and God's blessing her more than anybody else, by the way, because she was going to be the mother of Christ. Then we see uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, two old people, probably as old as I am or older. Maybe they're your age, brother. Yeah, I know you're not near as old as I am. But uh, they're old. And uh, they didn't have a child to carry on the, their lives. And the scripture says that he... Uh, was surprised, and he asked this question, How can I be sure of this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. I don't joke a whole lot in the pulpit, but uh, I've told you that uh, Sarah had a baby at 90, so I still hope. <laughs> I don't know. Uh... And then there's the little town of Bethlehem, small town. I don't know how many towns are in Israel, but uh, at least thousands, because here's what the uh, prophet Micah said, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me that's to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, if you look with me at Luke chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard it was as it was told unto them. The title message today, if you can see on the screen, is Why Sheep Herders. Let's look at the context for a moment or think about the context for a moment. Caesar Augustus has declared a taxation on his kingdom, which included Palestine at the time. And he declared that every man had to go to his hometown where he was from to be registered. Well, Mary is accompanying her beloved Joseph. They're engaged to be married, but they have not been married at this time. But they're together because they both were from Bethlehem. And uh, they probably walked 
the 70 miles. Now, I know we see pictures that uh, contradict that, but there's no donkey ever mentioned. And I've heard some people say that if there had been, Joseph would have been riding it, not Mary, because that's the way they did things in those days. But they're here, long ways from home, and she's, a, she's accompanying him. They're in Bethlehem, and the only find that place they can find to stay the night is a stable. Uh, it's possibly, probably likely a cave cutting, cutting the side of the mountain rather than a barn like we know it now. But that's where they could spend the night. They may have been surrounded by animals. There are none ever mentioned. And I know... I don't want to burst all your balloons today, but uh, we, ought to, we ought to find our truth from the Scriptures. And the Scriptures do not mention any animals at the stable. Uh, Mary is laboring to deliver a child. The Scripture tells us that by saying she was great with child. Maybe she ate a little extra, but she'd gained some weight, and she was really heavy, and she wanted to be rid of this burden that she carried. She wanted to give birth. So she's laboring to do that. God is looking down from heaven. He's not out of the picture, you know. He's looking down from heaven. And God himself took it upon himself to spread the news. The baby is wrapped in strips of cloth to keep it warm. God sends out a birth message that's like no others. The message comes through the angels. There's one angel that appears to uh, the shepherds, and he tells them that the, the Christ has been born in Bethlehem. He's born that night, and they can find him in Bethlehem lying in a manger. And then the scripture says, a whole host of angels joined that one and they began to say, Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace, goodwill to men, to all men. And it's, uh, we'll, look, we'll think about who the message is sent to a little later on. There's a bright light, the scripture says, and the glory of the Lord is shown round about. It's the biggest display of lights that's ever been, by the way, for Christmas. Uh, huge, I don't know whether it was bright as what the Apostle Paul saw on the road to Damascus or not, but it was a bright light, lit up the whole heavens, and the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, for this baby has been born. Just to put a pin in another balloon, Angels are never said to sing in the scriptures. They talk, they say, this, this passage says they said these words. We, uh, so often we get our theology from songs. I like the songs we sang this morning. Uh, and I like a lot of Christmas songs that really say a lot of things that aren't so. Brother Rogers, I wanted a drummer boy at the, at the manger. And uh, we don't know whether the cows lowering, lowing woke up Jesus or not. It's just not said. We're just not, not told that. But it was a great announcement. What should have been happen? What should have been expected, I mean? This was the greatest event of history. The one and only time that God took on human flesh. It's a new thing. It's an exciting thing. This baby would change the world, change us. If he hadn't changed you, then you're lost. If he has changed you, you're saved, and the message has been received by you. Our focus this morning, for the next few minutes, is on the people that God sent the message to. When you, were born, when you had a child or when your wife had a child, I'm sure you notified the grandparents. Uh, you already mentioned grandparents this morning. And great-grandparents. 
probably notified your kids if you had other kids, maybe even told your boss. Called a few aunts and uncles. Now, if some movie star had a baby, they would call People Magazine or Entertainment Tonight. When Princess Di had Prince William and Prince Harry, she possibly sent word to heads of state, uh, the heads of the different things that come under the umbrella of the Great Britain, political players, those of royal blood, but she probably didn't send any to the commoners, to the truck drivers, to the street cleaners, or the Australian DJs. She sent it to royalty, I'm sure. Here's the twist in God's birth announcement. There in Bethlehem was born the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. God was visiting this one time and once only. Never any other children did God sin like this. He's in His only begotten Son, as John 3.16 says. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, not anybody else, would have everlasting life. There's one son, no other births. It's the biggest birth in all of history. There's no other birth that's caused as much, uh, can I use the word commotion uh, reverently? So much change in the world, so much of everything. The mayor of Bethlehem does not get the announcement. The high priest in Jerusalem is left out. Caesar in his palace is not told. None of the Roman officials got, got word of this. None of the Jewish officials got word of this. The palace didn't hear. The temple didn't hear. Jerusalem didn't hear. A group of shepherds out on the hillside or in the field, maybe I should say, got the message. The message that God gives goes to a group of sheep herders on the outskirts of Bethlehem. And I don't know what's in your mind, but a big why comes in my mind. Why did he go to the shepherds? Seems like the most unlikely group of people that would get the announcements, but he did that. Why the shepherds? Why not more noble recipients? Why waste it on farmers or shepherds? There may have been many reasons. I want to look at two of them this morning with you. And they are God intentionally provides a glimpse into the nature of Jesus' ministry as the Good Shepherd. Number two, God intentionally seeks out and uses those that people consistently overlook, disregard, and count out. The same thing is true today, by the way. By appearing to the shepherds, Jesus' connection to shepherding is emphasized. You know, all through the Old Testament, shepherding, shepherding and God's leaders had a parallel. Uh, always. The great leaders in Israel's history had a connection with shepherding. Long before he was a prophet of God, Moses was out in the backside of the de desert keeping sheep for his father-in-law, who was the priest of Midian. And it was as a shepherd boy that he got the call from God through a bush that wouldn't, that wouldn't burn up, that he was to be his prophet and go deliver his people. Exodus 3 says, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert. He's away from home. And he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'm going to turn aside and see this thing, see what's happening here. This bush not burning up. Before him, years earlier, 
Abraham was a shepherd. The scripture says he had very he was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And cattle in that day most of the time was, was sheep. Uh, they were shepherds. Sometime later after Abraham, Jacob with his family of 75 went down to Egypt to live because Joseph was there and had a plan to feed everybody. He went down and they were settled in the land of Goshen because they were shepherds. Job had a great farm. And the first thing that's mentioned about Job is he had 7,000 sheep. Probably took more than one shepherd to look after him. But he, uh, he had to have shepherds on his land there. David was a shepherd boy when Saul anointed him to be king of Israel. You remember David came, uh, Samuel came and went through all the sons of Jesse. And every one of them, God said, that's not the one. And finally he said, have you got any more sons? Well, I've got a boy out watching the sheep. Well, we won't sit down and eat till he comes. And God took David from shepherding sheep and he became the shepherd to the whole nation. Psalm 78, he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the great, the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with the skillfulness of his hand. The scripture says that God took David from being a shepherd boy looking after sheep and made him a shepherd to the whole nation. And he led that nation, I guess, as he did the sheep with the integrity of his heart. God had in time past raised up shepherds to lead Israel to a greater knowledge of God. Now the master shepherd has just been born. Isaiah the prophet foretold that the coming Savior of Israel would be a shepherd to God's people. He described the Messiah as one who would feed his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs in his arms, carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. He carries us when we're sick. He carries us when we're hurting. He carries us when we're full of despair. You ever get full of despair? I've been there before several times. And uh, there's a picture somewhere. I, I don't know if I've ever seen one here or not, but it's uh, a guy that's walking along, I think in the sand, and he looks back and there's no, there's no prints behind him somewhere. And uh, it says, well, that's, the Lord said, that's when I was carrying you. Sometimes we need carrying. Jesus does that for us. Amen. Jesus' ministry is, ministry is similar to shepherding. By first announcing the birth of Christ to shepherds, we get a glimpse of his ministry. It would be like shepherding, trying to get people to follow the Lord. It's like herding sheep, Brother Roger. I'm sure you've got a wonderful church here and everybody follows everything the Lord wants them to do. But uh, in my experience, sometimes it's uh, been uh, pretty difficult work. It's hard work. There's never a day off. Sheep need constant care and attention. The Lord talked about his care for Jerusalem one day. And he said this, these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I have gathered you unto myself, and ye would not. Ye would not. Sheep need constant attention and care. Left alone for a moment, and trouble finds them. The crowd woos them back into the world, or they get hooked on booze or drugs or sex, or many other things. Just left for alone for a minute. We need constant looking after. 
We ought not to just get people saved. We need to disciple people. I, I, I'm surprised sometimes when I meet people and talk to them, they don't have the slightest idea about what the Scripture teaches about living close to Christ and following Him. But the Scriptures replete with instructions that we're to follow. And if sheep aren't led, they'll stray. The shepherds were committing, committed to their sheep. They had to be. Sheep are notoriously dumb. They do things that are just a matter of reason. Will eat themselves sick if left in one place too long. The shepherd has to go out before the flock goes out and he finds the place to take them for pasture. And he leads them here and he leads them there. He takes them up in the mountain. He brings them back down the valley. But if they stay in one place and eat too long, they'll get sick. In, in uh, preparing this, I was thinking about how uh, Christians get sick, sick sometimes. They find one verse of Scripture, maybe a passage of Scripture, and they read it, and they get hung up on that verse of Scripture or that doctrine, and that's all they think about, and uh, they get sick. They don't think about everything the Scriptures teach. And uh, sort of like sheep eating one place all the time. Many years ago, I pastored here in North Wilkesboro, a couple of churches, and I had a man there that got hung up on a verse of Scripture. Actually, he got hung up on a little book. Uh, I am the true vine, you're the branches. And that, that verse just, he, that's all he talked about. And uh, it just almost made him crazy. He got to where he was beating his wife, and uh, she came to, at this time I had uh, resigned the church, and the, the new pastor and I went out to see him and uh, try to get him to go to the hospital and get some help. But he was so hung up on this one verse, that's, that's all he talked about. Sunday morning, in the home, everywhere he went, he talked about that one verse. And uh, I said a minute ago, I didn't joke much from the pulpit, but I'm going to tell a little story. We got to his house and walked in, sat down, and the television was turned out backwards. And so we asked him, said, what's the telephone turning around for? He said, it's been mean, I'm punishing it. But he'd also been hitting on his wife. So we finally talked him into going to the doctor. And I was driving, the other preacher was beside me. He got in the back seat. And we started down the road. Uh, it was right there behind the Apple House, the Apple Co-op. And uh, he came across the back seat and he got me in a chokehold and tried to wreck us. And the other preacher finally got him to turn loose. And when he turned loose, he was all right for a few seconds. And we were coming up on the road. You know, do y'all know where the, the news story is called Cupboard? It's, uh, it's changed its name. It's on, it's on uh, 16, going toward Taylorsville, close to, close to Moravian Falls. And we got up the road, and there was a highway patrolman in front of us, and he pulled in that store. And so the other guy said, well, we probably ought to go in there. And we did, and uh, the other preacher got out and went inside, to talk to the patrolman about the fact that we needed some help to get him to the hospital. And as the other preacher got out of the car, this guy said, well, take, hit him with the sword. And he's talking about the scripture, of course. And uh, so the other guy went on in, he was talking to the patrolman, and all of a sudden the guy in the back seat got out on the other side of the car, so I got out also. And he said, uh, I said, I don't believe he hit him with the sword. I said, no, I don't think he has yet. That guy took off running. He went in the store, grabbed the Bible out of the preacher's hand, and hit that patrolman upside of the head. He was in a straitjacket in seconds. 
but it all started, at least we at, we at church noticed the problem because he was dwelling on this one verse of Scripture, and he was just beating his wife to death verbally with it, as well as using his fist. So we need to study the whole Scripture and find out what the whole Scripture say, says to us. Sheep are oblivious to danger. I wonder how many people sitting in church this morning all across this nation are oblivious to the danger that they face as a Christian. There are all kinds of problems out in the world that will trip us up if we're not careful. But sheep, sheep don't, uh, they're oblivious to that. This sheep mindlessly follow the sheep right in front of them. If, uh, if, a sheep, if sheep are in a line going somewhere and one sheep falls over the bank and rolls into the water, the next sheep will do the same thing. He just mindlessly follows that sheep in front of him. Sometimes church members do the same thing. Perhaps I should just say Christians do the same thing. One follows Baal, and the one that's right behind him very likely will start following Baal also. Or one falls in to drink, and the one right behind him that looks up to him, he'll follow right after him. I'm sad to relate this, but it fits the point here. The church that I'm actually still a member of in Calabash, North Carolina, we've got a couple of guys that are trying to get the church to change its stance on drinking. They think that uh, the church ought to say, it's all right to drink. If they stay there, sooner or later they'll get some more followers. It's just sheep of that way they follow strong people. A lot of times it's not uh, that kind of sin, but uh, somebody get mad at the preacher. And the person that's right behind that person, maybe uh, he looks up to that person, he'll follow him and he'll get mad. And before long, you may have a half a dozen. And sooner or later, the church will split. It's happened time and time again. When I was in college in Winston-Salem, I think almost every church that was connected to the school split while I lived there. People couldn't get along. Sheep are that way, and sometimes church members are too. Like uh, the Israelites who were dumb in the ways of God and very stubborn, so are Christians today. Rooted in our own ways and not even easily changed. Sometimes we have made up our own rules. And if people don't follow them, we get mad. Then Jesus would be the Lamb of God. God appeared to the shepherds that night, knowing his son was the great shepherd, who would pay the ultimate price and lay down his life for theirs. He's the perfect lamb. We don't know who this, what kind of sheep the shepherds were watching. They may have been watching the sacrificial sheep those that were be sacrificed at the temple. We're not told what they were watching, but they were watching, they were watching sheep. And God announced to them that night that the perfect sacrificial lamb had been born. Isaiah 53, 7, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is done, so he opened not his mouth. John the Baptist announced one day, Jesus is coming toward him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's who was born this night. Here in one event, the shepherd and the lamb was born. The temple sacrifices would come to an end. Have you ever thought about the thousands of lambs that were being slain the same day Christ died? Christ was the final lamb. He was the perfect lamb. And he would sacrifice his blood to atone for the sins 
of all men. And Jesus tonight in this birth, that spotless lamb had been born. And that spotless lamb of God would do the whole work of salvation by himself. As a boy, I used to read a lot, and I don't know where the books came from. Probably got them out of the church library, I'm not sure. But I read uh, several books, and even at the time, I knew something was wrong. But those books were titled this way, God plus Nancy equals this or that. You know, it's like God plus Nancy causes Ben to get saved. We need to be really careful about what we, how we say things like that. God, through Christ, accomplished salvation by Himself. There's no help that we can give Him. There's no sacrifice that we can make. There's no work that we can do that will add to what He's already done. Romans 3.25, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. John 14, 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. And Jesus also said in chapter 10 of John that if someone tries to climb up another way into heaven, he's a thief and a robber. There is no salvation apart from this lamb that was born that we just read about. There's no salvation in any other. I think it was on the day of Pentecost that Peter preached that. No salvation in any other. Whereby, I don't know the name whereby we must be saved. Well, the second point I want to talk about, God intentionally used the overlooked as messengers of the good news. What were the shepherds like? They were not as we picture them in our nativity scenes. We look at our nativity scenes and we see the figurines and they look so pretty and handsome. We say, oh, they got such holy faces. Uh, they must be heavenly. No, the, the shepherds were filthy, dirty men out there looking after sheep. They were social outcasts. They're not mild-mannered. They're not mild-mannered altar boys that we might imagine. They were borderline social outcasts. They didn't fit in the country. They were rambling all over the place with sheep. Didn't have much home life. They didn't have a nine to five job. They didn't have any kids. They didn't have a fence with a swing in the backyard. They didn't have a two car garage. They were drifters in society. The reputation that they had was that of a thief. They didn't look good, smell good, or talk very well. They were also religious outcasts. Jewish law demanded that five times a year, it's three or five, all Jewish men had to come to Jerusalem to do sacrifice to the festivals that they had. They couldn't participate because they were out in the fields watching sheep. If you touched a shepherd, you became unclean too. When they did come to the temple once in a while, they got those looks of, why are you here? You know the looks I'm talking about, don't you? It happens in every church. The look of, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? What's your kind doing at our church? I was asked a question one day by a church member. Don't those people have their own kind of church they can go to? God didn't have a place for you. Clean yourself up. The shepherds were, were very backward. They didn't, they didn't have the new trends in clothing. They didn't have the savvy talk that the, uh, maybe the upper class would have. They didn't have the latest gadgets, toys, Laptops, personal web pages. They had a rod and a staff. That's all. 
They were expert in using it, but they were dirty, and they lived out there in the fields. They were treated as outcasts, overlooked, and being not good enough. Does it make sense why they uh, were so afraid when the angel appeared? It would have scared me. Right now, if one walked in the back door, we're not outside, cause I can't say if they hovered overhead. But right now, if one walked through the back door, I guarantee you scare every person in this building. They were afraid. But the angel said, don't be afraid, fear not. Did you know every time in the scripture that I can find that an angel appeared to somebody, they were scared, they were afraid. The angel of the Lord came to Hagar and uh, when Ishmael was out there about to die of thirst and he said, fear not, God has heard the cry of the lad. When the angel came to Joseph, he said, fear not. Don't be afraid to take this woman under wife. And when the Lord appeared to Mary, she was afraid. Or when Gabriel appeared to Mary, she was afraid. And every time that it's mentioned that one appeared to someone, the words fear not are included in the voice of the angel. Don't be afraid. Even the donkey that Balaam was riding was fearful when he saw the Lord coming at him with a sword and turned out of the way to keep from meeting the Lord. It was for the overlook that, of this world that heaven lit up that night with the announcement came. God threw the switch and the big, biggest display of lights you've ever imagined came to the sky. And if... Uh, if the angel hadn't scared him, the light probably would have. But it was a big display of light. God intensely uses the overlooked as his messengers. That way he gets all the glory. God doesn't play power games with folks. And he doesn't cater or deal with inflated egos. So many people have got inflated egos that they're not any use to God. God uses those that are down, outcasts of society, and that's what he did with these shepherds that night. By using people that the world considers second rate, God displays his power. When the shepherds went out, they confirmed the things that had been told them. They came to Bethlehem, saw the babe, worshipped the babe, and then left to begin telling what they'd seen. Did y'all know a baby's been born tonight and he's, he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? And all that heard them wondered at what they said. I want to close by reading one short passage in Corinthians and make two or three comments and we'll be gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 29. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. He goes on to say that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And he says that God has chosen foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And then he asks the question, Hath, hath God chosen Let's see, hath God chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise? And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
Can you relate to the shepherds this morning? Do you feel overlooked and downtrodden? Let me assure you today that this same child that was born then has defeated Satan. He's paid for sin. And now he calls you to not be afraid, but to come unto him. The message to you is the same as the angels gave that night. Unto you a Savior is born, Christ the Lord. And if you have a hard time relating to shepherds and to those other people that are downtrodden, God wants us to remember that we're all equal in His sight. When we come to the foot of the cross, the ground's level, every one of us is a sinner in need of salvation. Perhaps this morning you don't know Jesus. Perhaps this morning you think you're uh, above the shepherds. Perhaps you think this morning that you're going to make it some other way. Let me assure you that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, His Son. And the Son came to die. He didn't come to live a flowery life. He came to die. He knew when He was born that He would die. He did not give up His Godhood when He became man. He left His glory behind, but He He's still God when he became a baby. And he knew that he had come for one purpose, and that's to die for our sins. Perhaps this morning you don't know him, and if you'd like to know him, Preacher Roger will be standing here at the front as we sing a closing hymn. Come talk to him. He'd love to talk to you about salvation. Let's stand. Thank mm-hmm. you.